On bounded rationality, you know, I told you there are sort of several different ways people do boundedly rational models last class, and, and the one I emphasized was this sort of psychology and economic style where you take one of these rationality-like models you see in, in behavioral economics classes and you sort of think about what happens when consumers do behave like that and firms exploit them. Um, but sort of the, let me say the motivate the rule of thumb approach, I guess one philosophic question of like, why is it we ever even do economics with rational models to begin with? You know, when we have, you know, you do so, write down some rational model and then you have some very complicated, you know, if you're going to publish a paper top journal, you've got very complicated art, mathematical argument of eight pages of calculations proving what happens under this set of assumptions. And, and then you sort of say, therefore, this happens in this industry. And your question is like, why do we believe that in the first place? You know, like, like there's some parts of rationality that we really do believe that like if people can do something that's better for themselves, they'll do it and they have some preferences, they have some goals they're trying to achieve. You can't keep fooling them over and over again, they will catch on to things. But you know, the full rationality, I think we don't really believe it. And you know, same with these sort of behavioral models, like okay, we believe people are short-sighted, but do we really believe the sort of beta, beta hat delta quasi-hyperbolic model? Why not any other functional form? And you know, if their people are being fooled, are, is that gonna keep working on them in that model? Or are they gonna sort of change the way they behave when they realize that their life is going badly because of something that they do? And are they gonna introspect and change it? Um, and you know, so I, I mean, I think one answer why we do that is it does prevent you from cheating. It prevents you from sort of just assuming people do this and then getting your conclusion right away. But you know, you can still cheat with rational modeling and you just sort of, when you're writing down the preferences and you're writing down the cost functions and you're writing down the other things, you, and the information, you slip in a lot of extra assumptions that in some sense let you get your conclusion anyway. Um, and you know, so then maybe, you know, sociology of economics, one of the reasons we do that is because to publish a paper, you need to have eight pages of complicated seeming complications to show that you've accomplished something hard in your paper, and then that rationality like lets you do that. Um, but then the question is, you know, you know, is it really a good model if it takes a lot of pages of complicated calculations to find out what happens? Because that's when we don't really all the minor things that are depart from rationality don't matter, or or could make have an effect. And so what the like the rule of thumb approach tends to do is say that. Rather than, rather than writing down a rational model and sticking with it, even though it's really hard to solve and we may not believe it, why don't we just write down a model that we think is more like what, we think is kind of like what consumers do and we're happy to buy that as an approximation, that's easy to solve. And so instead of thinking of the assumptions on information and costs and whatever, the, and, and you know, epsilon IJKs being logit distributed, Let's just go straight to the behavior, write down a behavior that makes the model tractable and like let us describe what happens. So I'll, I'll start with an example, uh, you know, Smallwood and Conlisk is one of my, uh, you know, favorite classic economics papers, um, you know, that didn't get taught when I took I.O. But, you know, Smallwood and Conlisk start with, you know, they, they have the sort of question they're starting from of, um, you know, are superior products going to win out in the long run in the market? And, and do superior products sort of take over markets and, and outcompete inferior products in a world where people don't know the quality of every product when, it, when it's first invented? Uh, and so they use the example of, suppose you have someone buying a box of cereal, and they're standing here looking at the supermarket shelf, and they're trying to decide what to buy. You know, obviously they've only tasted some small fraction of those cereals, and so they have to go there and look at the prices of some subset of them, and think about how much they're going to like them and what, you know, will they like it or not? If I buy it, you know, what's the probability I'll like it? Will I like it enough that I'll want to buy it again? And then how much extra utility will I get from the future purchases of that cereal, not of the extra information? And they said, well, what's even much worse is imagining that like when you're going to buy the box of cereal, you're just walking up, you know, to the shelf and you sort of see that person in front of you buying a box of cereal. And then what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to say, okay, well, that person is buying this box of cereal. If they bought that box of cereal, they must like that cereal. And so if they like that cereal, and then our epsilon, you know, these things are, there's a CJ and an epsilon IJK, our CJs, that, the CJ must be high for that cereal, conditional on that person buying it. But then you think, well, wait, no, but this person might be buying it because he's tasted it before, or that person might be buying it because, you know, you know, two days earlier, that person was, you know, sitting, 
sitting on their couch at home and there was a TV and they were watching a TV and there was a commercial and they saw the TV commercial for that cereal. But then, well, but if they did buy the, see the TV commercial, <clears throat> you know, what's the signaling value of the TV commercial that they saw? Because the firm wouldn't have advertised the cereal unless it knew people were going to repeat purchase it. So maybe after sort of a prior over the cost of that cereal and the reasons why a TV commercial would have been on, um, but then again, you know, maybe this person's buying it because the person who was two people before them in the aisle bought it and they saw the person before take it off that aisle. Or maybe they're just buying it because it's at eye level. But if it's at eye level, there's this signaling problem of, you know, who pay- is it? why is it at eye level? Is it at eye level because it's really popular or is it at eye level because the firm paid the store to put it at eye level and would they have paid more or less to put it at eye level if it was good or bad? But especially the, if this person saw the person before, it's almost like I need this you know, prior over all possible purchases by every person since the invention of cereal in the 19th century and who saw what and what they did and what that did to their popularity. And then I've got to sort of have that prior over that enormous network of of a century's worth of cereal purchases and then invert it and figure out now what's my posterior on that cereal box. And and small one kind of view is that this is insane. You know, like this is not what people do. People walk up, they look at the cereal box, they're buying 50 different things in the supermarket. Most of the time, they just take off the shelf whatever they normally take off the shelf. And then every once in a while, they've got a little extra time, and they sort of like put a little bit of time into thinking, which one do I buy? And so why don't we sort of think about consumers more like that and ask about, you know, then what would happen? Would good cereal brands take over, or do we think that, you know, Cheerios is really popular even though Cheerios isn't very good or whatever it is? Um, Okay, so here's you know, what Small One and Conlis did in this idea of just trying to write down, let's write down a dynamic model that seems reasonable to us and talk about what's the long run implications in terms of do superior brands take over when consumers are fairly naive in their shopping. Um, okay, and, I, and I think they very much do believe that consumers are naive when they shop um, and that, that, that prior, this, is, this is a better model than the rational one. So anyway, here's their model. Products differ in quality. Uh, Consumer of product K has a bad experience, which they'll call a breakdown with probability BK. So if if you're talking about people buying light bulbs, that could be literally the probability that the light bulb burns out in in any given, uh, between any given shopping trip. If it's a cereal, it just could be that every once in a while you're eating your cereal and just occurs to you in the morning like, you know, this really isn't all that good, maybe I should buy a different cereal. So, but products differ in the probability of giving a bad experience, and so the highest quality products are the ones with the lowest BK. Okay. Uh, what consumers do is they always continue to buy the same product they bought previously until one of these breakdowns occur. When the breakdown occurs, they, they decide to buy product K with some probability, uh, MK of T raised to the sigma power, where MK of T is the market share of the product. So they just buy it with some probability that's related to the product's current market share. So one example, sigma equals zero. Sigma equals zero would just be when a breakdown occurs, I just buy a product in proportion to its popularity. So it could be that the supermarket stock shelves so that the number of boxes of each cereal is related to how many people buy it, and therefore I just pick one off the shelf entirely at random. Um, Sorry. Sigma zero would be that there's one box of each cereal. I pick the box of the cereal off at random when there's one box of each. Um, Sigma equals one is um, I, I buy it in proportion to the market share. So that could be they stock more boxes of, you know, the more popular series get more more shelf space and you pick according to shelf space. Or it could be that I watch the person before me, I see them pick off a cereal and I I say, okay, that person likes it, maybe I will try it. So that would be a sigma equals one model. Um, A larger sigma could be, you know, some explicit reasoning about popularity saying this one seems to be the most popular, maybe I will try that. That I think popularity is probably correlated with fewer breakdowns Therefore, I will buy a more popular brand. And so, you know, you know, sigma going to infinity would be you buy the most popular brand with probability one. Um, and then the main result, uh, small one economist, is that 
With fairly naive consumers, social learning can work very well. And it, what it has to be is they have to use the a right amount of weight on popularity. So the theorem is if sigma equals 1, uh, the most popular product dominates in the t goes to infinity limit. That is, the product that has the smallest bk, um, so it's that mk of t uh, goes to 1, so the limit is t goes to infinity of mk of t goes to 1 for, the, for k equals the uh, argmin of uh, bk. So whatever, the product that has the lowest breakdown probability has its market share converge to 1 in the long run. So the best product takes over, all other products die out. Okay. And that happens when people put the sigma equals 1 weight on probability. So they're not really explicit. It, it's as if you just do the watch one person in front of you uh, model. So it's using very minimal information about probability. That converges to 1. Um, when sigma is less than 1, uh, we converge to a state with all k products active. So each, each product has a, then a, a market share between 0 and 1 in the long run. Inferior products stay alive in the market. Superior products have bigger market shares if they don't go to 1. Uh, and then if you know, anything like the sigma equals infinity, but any, any sigma greater than 1 where you pick the most popular product, then inferior products can come to dominate the market, where if you just get some initial popularity, you're initially popular, people buy you, your popularity just goes to 1, and, and superior products can't outcompete you because you're more popular. So small and kind argument was that you know, markets can select things, but there's, there's sort of this awkward part of it is that consumers have to be fairly naive to get the market to select the best products. They have to put fairly little weight on popularity. They put some weight on popularity, but it's got to be this sort of equivalent to the sigma equals 1 weight on popularity to get social learning to work out. Um, OK, anyway, so I, I'm just going to then just talk about a couple other papers that have um, built on this and done other things. So um, you know, I, I have a paper with um, Drew, uh, 1995, where we sort of try to take the Smallwood and Conlisk idea and make it a bit more like a classic economics utility framework. So again, so here, now when consumer eyes uh, consume products, they receive utility. And the utility you get from consuming a product is a product-specific mean. This is like the, the CJ or whatever. So you get a product-specific mean utility. And you get an epsilon I, I, IKT, which is your own idiosyncratic preference. Um, and we're going to assume that the um, utility difference between product 1 and probability 2 is a random variable where sometimes prob product 1 is better, or sometimes product 2 is better. So this is something about these products that there's a period specific uh, choice to them that makes one of them better than the other. So for instance, it could be that like these two products are not actually cereal boxes. It could be those two products are ways to drive to work. Do I drive to work on the Mass Pike? Do I drive to work on Storo Drive? And every day, one of those two ways to drive to work is better, uh, but it changes from day to day. Um, you know, it could be that these are products that you're buying where there are two restaurants, and you know, because the food quality varies from day to day due to the quality of the ingredients or the chef that's working, on some days shop A is be the food is better than shop B, and on some days shop B is better. Um, you know, or it could be that these are different. You know, in you're buying from different insurance companies, and if like there's a bad event, then one of them was better to ha have bought from, and if there's a no bad event, then the other one is better to have bought from. So we have something that makes the quality of the two products differ. Um, product one is better with probability p. So you know you would like to buy the product product one if p is bigger than a half, and buy product two if p is less than a half. Okay. And then we have Smallwood conlisk like consumers. Um, we don't have breakdowns, but so the inertia part is consumers buy the same product they bought previously with probability one minus alpha. And with probability alpha, they try to decide what they should, they consider changing and think about what they should buy. 
Uh, and when they consider changing, what they do is ask n of their friends about their most recent experience. Um, you know, I form uh, u uh, one t bar to be the sum. You know, or it's you know, I form u one t bar and u two t bar. This is like the average of the utilities received by all my friends who use product one. This is the average of the utilities of all my friends who use product two, and then I pick whichever one has the better average when I when I've surveyed them. Again, you know, the, I asked the friends who who I asked the friends who took Storo Drive, uh, which is better for them, and vice versa. Um, and then if all friends, if everyone I asked bought the same product, then I just buy that one. So I, I take an average of zero over zero is negative infinity. So I don't buy that one. And so the observation is, in this model, again, we can sometimes get optimal social learning from just asking friends about products. Um, typically, this occurs when n is fairly small. So this is a graph showing, as a function of alpha, What's the range of n's for which? Um, what's the range of n's for which this model gives efficient social learning? And this graph is, seems to be showing us that if alpha is close to one, almost everybody is asking their friends every period. Then you need to be asking three, four, five, or six friends. Most of the time, when alpha is small, this model with the ask one friend what they bought works well. So in some sense, asking one friend what they bought, it, that's a lot like Smallwood and Conlist, because that's like choosing in proportion to market share. Uh, but then when alpha is bigger, what you want to do is gather more information, and the more information helps you find the better products. Uh, and again, you know, the, what's going on here is that you know, there's this sort of uh, more better products do have higher mean utilities. Uh, and then there's also some uh, effect of popularity weighting in that if something is more popular, you're more likely to hear about it and more likely to not hear about the popularity. And the combination of those two things can give us social learning, but doesn't give us social learning if n is too big. And then one other uh, paper along these lines. Um, uh, Ronnie Spiegler has a paper. Uh, Another follow-on paper he calls the market for quacks, which is you know the uh, my paper with Drew. We were sort of following Smallwood and Conlisk in not having any prices at all in the model, uh, which you know works well for the people learning which way to drive to work or learning things like that. It doesn't work as well necessarily for buying products. Um, Spiegler sort of thinks about what happens in word-of-mouth models if you let the firm set prices. Um, so he calls the market for quacks because he's thinking about the application. His application he's thinking about is um, people selling the many medications and health things or whatever that you see on advertised online that are probably no better than not buying some kind of health supplement that's supposed to improve your whatever. Um, and so what he imagines is that he has this model where you have this large number of products. And whenever you consume one of these products, with probability alpha, you do get a good outcome after having consumed it. Um, but of course, there's an outside option that gives you utility zero, you know, that costs zero, and you also get a positive experience sometimes after not consuming any of these products. And in particular, he's got that sort of the outside option, you know, there's an outside option uh, which you know, also gives you a good experience with probability alpha and cost zero. Okay, so the alpha outside option is actually just better than all of these products. Um, but so what happens is, you know, the utility that a consumer I gets in period t if they buy product k is one minus pkt with probability alpha, and minus pkt with probability one minus alpha. And what consumers do in each period is, you know, again, it's like uh, we have. Like Smallwood and Conlisk, we have this continuum of consumers. Some consumers are using every product. What consumers do is, in each period is ask one user of each product about their experience and buy the product that would give the highest utility, assuming the same experience, if it gives positive utility. So you know, I ask, there are k different products. I find one person using each product. I would like, how did you like it? Did it work for you? And three people tell you that, yeah, the product worked for me. It gave me utility one. 
uh, but I paid this for it. Seven people tell you I didn't like it, I gave me utility zero, and I paid money for it, so I got negative utility. And so then what consumers do is they, you know, they, they pick the, they, you know, in some sense they're gonna choose among the products that gave utility one to their friends, the one that's offered at the lowest price this period. And if every one of their friends got zero, got negative utility, then they just buy the outside option. Um, okay, what happens here? Um, this model is, you know, if you go, think back to like the stall model of price dispersion, this model is going to be sort of kind of like that stall model of price dispersion. Because imagine you're a firm, uh, you know, you're a firm, and you know that there are going to be some consumers out there who heard positive reviews of your product and negative reviews of every other product. And so if they earn heard a positive news about your product and negative about everybody else's, you'd want to set P equals one. But then there are going to be other consumers who heard positive things about your product and about exactly one other product. And so if they heard positive things about two products, including yours, you want to be epsilon less than the product that they heard, the other product they heard good things about. And so it, it's kind of like that sort of stall model where there's multiple types of consumers, the consumers who heard good things only about yours, who, where you're like the, like they're like the non-shoppers, and the consumers who heard good things about you and several others, and there you want to sort of be undercutting the other prices. So, you know, what you're going to get is some kind of mixed strategy equilibrium where, you know, you're mixing over some interval and you're sometimes charging a high price and sometimes charging a low price to try to get the people who've heard about multiple products. Uh, it's not as extreme as that style model in that there's, you know, it's going to be very rare for consumers who have heard about all end products, so you don't need to be the single lowest price product in the market to get people. They probably only heard about two or three or something like that. And so anyway, that's, you'll have some distribution, I imagine it probably looks like this, of what prices look like. Um, Interesting observation is that uh, in this model, price is inversely related to product quality. So if you imagine, you know, if these, um, if the products are all, like this is common product quality, if the products are all good and people actually have positive experiences with them, then you as a firm selling are gonna be like, okay, if someone heard about my, uh, uh, their friend had a good experience with, with my product, they probably also talk to friends who had good experiences with the other products, so I'm probably competing with three or four or five or six other products for their business, therefore I need to price aggressively to be, beat those four or five or six products. But if the products are terrible and there's like a one in a hundred chance that they actually do anything, then you'd think, okay, well, if someone had a positive experience with my product, then they'll, when, they're, when they're asking for you know, they, asked, they found a friend who liked my product, they probably didn't find a friend who liked any of the other products, so I'm probably a monopolist, so I'm probably safe pricing close to one. So in equilibrium, competition between low quality products, we get high prices, competition between high quality products, we get low prices. Uh, and the reason is that the competition between high quality products is actually more real competition, whereas the competition for the low quality products is just getting the people who had the rare mistaken impression. And again, you know, right, so this is not, a, you know, this is not a fully rational model. The consumers are not somehow inverting the equilibrium price distribution or inverting the market shares and realizing, okay, if prices are, you know, if prices are high, it must be that the quality is low. Therefore, I'm learning that, I'm learning something about, I had a prior about alpha, now I'm learning something about alpha or I'm not, updating alpha from realizing that I'm just getting IID, you know, these are all, these seem to be IID draws as I draw them every period. They're just sort of every period taking, this person liked it, therefore this is quality one, this person didn't like it, these are all quality zero. Um, but I, I, you know, I think Spiegler's view is that, uh, you know, this seems like a, seems like a reasonable force and, and that the sort of naive model may be a better way to think about that this force of competition or quality drives down prices could be a real thing. Okay, uh, second thing I want to do is, and I, you know, figured I would do something fun today uh, for, in, in honor of being here before the holiday. So um, anyway, I'm gonna talk about, this is a, uh, another rule of uh, thumb paper I've written. It's not actually really an IO paper, but I feel it's useful for graduate students who have thought about these issues. 
Um, so this is a paper thinking about uh, the journal refereeing process. So you know, six or seven years from now, you know, many of you will be professors and you'll be sitting in offices somewhere and this is what you'll be complaining about is the journal refereeing process. Um, so, you know, in, in particular, you know, what, what's um, very difficult is, you know, people find out is it's somehow it's very, very hard to publish an economics paper and it takes years and years and years and years and you try to write about something topical and then it takes five years to get your paper through the journal refereeing process and after five years getting through the journal refereeing process, your wonderfully topical thing is now completely irrelevant because the things you're writing about are no longer topical. Um, you know, actually, I, the experience, I'm, I'm a you know, department, I'm also on promotions and tenure committee for like people in other departments and like in other social science fields where people write books, this problem also just appears in spades. We're constantly reading cases of, here's this person, they've been a faculty member for five years, their book, which was based on their graduate student thesis is still not out yet because they've just been revising their book for the past five years and the book is you know, five years less timely than it was when they wrote it originally. Okay, so anyway, how do I think about why publication works this way? Here's a theory. So in, 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 my, in the model, papers have a two-dimensional quality, Q and R. Um, Q I think of as the fundamental idea in the paper or the quality of the in, unchangeable insight that this paper has. You know, the Q is what you would teach when you teach that paper in your graduate course. This is the paper's idea. This is how that paper changes the way we think about something. This was their interesting idea they came up with. And then the R is the other dimensions of quality that you can improve in a revision. So rather than having linear functional forms, you can do everything with arbitrary functional forms. You can sort of go through the seven most recent econometric techniques published in Econometrica and re-estimate it using these seven different estimators and talk about how all those estimators do things. You know, obviously some parts of the things we improve in revision are making us more confident in the results. They are valuable. Many of them are just doing everything addressing every potential criticism that anyone could have come up with and just continuing to sort of just make your paper harder and harder um, to read. Um, okay, but so we value both aspects of quality, the sort of uh, idea part and the craftsmanship part. Um, and referees know that they're supposed, that there's a sort of social norm in the profession that we put alpha weight on the Q and we put one minus alpha weight on the R and they know that they're supposed to recommend acceptance if this weighted average of Q and R is at least Z. But referees being people who are in general, you know, 32 years old or whatever, not in the profession for all that long, don't necessarily know what alpha and Z are and they're trying to learn, you know, they're just trying to be good referees and evaluate papers appropriately when asked to evaluate a paper. And so at time T, the profession ends up using these weights, alpha T and Z T, and all the members, referees in the profession are just trying to update all the time and learn what is alpha T, what's the weight on these two, and what's the thresh, quality threshold, where I'm supposed to say yes versus no. Um, I assume that authors rationally divide their time between producing the two types of quality. Um, they start by picking some amount of time T, Q. So one is a total amount of time you have available. You start by spending some time TQ in 0, 1 uh, to get a random draw on an idea. And at the end of that time TQ that you spent getting a, a developing random draws on the ideas, then uh, you get an idea of quality Q and there's some CDF F of Q given TQ that's increasing. So for instance, it could be that just Q is uniform on 0 to TQ is one. But you could also make it, you know, normal mean t, mean TQ or whatever. Um, and then after you get your idea, you send your paper into the journal and they evaluate your paper. Um, and then they tell you how good, they give you sort of some answer, uh, R of Q, which is like if you can make your paper, get your sort of craftsmanship up to quality R of Q, we would take your paper. Otherwise, no, it's not good enough. So here's your paper. Uh, in, in general, actually, you know, like it's, um, you know, you send a paper to a lot of top economics journals, say you're going to get five referee reports that are going to be a total of like 18 pages long and have 67 comments of things you could improve in your paper. And, you know, you then decide, they sort of, they're telling you 
how much you have to do to get the paper into the journal. And then authors decide how much time of their remaining time between 0 and 1 minus TQ to spend improving the paper. And time spent improving the craftsmanship increases R to H of TR uh, plus eta, where eta is, again, some random variable. So sometimes you're able to do the things well. Sometimes you're not able to do the things well. And then I make eta, again, a uniform distribution. Um, and then what editors do is editors accept the highest quality papers that are resubmitted. You know, the editors all also know alpha T. They all know the current market weights on these things. The editors, though, don't use ZT. The editors, like, they know how many papers they're supposed to accept, so they just accept the best paper. You know, even if the referee has told people to do more than was feasible, the editors have to go against the referee and say, I have to accept something. And so the editors just accept some fraction tau of papers that are highest on this metric, alpha Q plus 1 minus alpha R. Good. So anyway, that's my model of, of academics writing and revising papers. Um, First observation, you know, this model has a continuum of consistent social norms. You know, if I pick, if you think about it, you know, if I pick any alpha, if I pick alpha equals one, so only Q counts, if only Q counts, what people are going to do is just spend 100% of their time producing ideas, have zero craftsmanship, and there's going to be some level Z that clears the market. So if you spend 100% of your time on Q quality, um, a fraction tau of people are going to get qualities above this level, and one minus tau are going to get qualities below that level, and that clears the market. Um, if you spend, if you choose alpha equals zero, then people are going to spend zero time thinking up ideas, and they're just going to sort of have very, very complicated estimations or proofs of their non-ideas. They're going to have incredibly high levels of R quality, but they're going to have no ideas in the paper. And again, the people who get the best draws, everyone spends time one. The people who get the best draws here, the tau fraction get the best draws, get their papers published. The other people who get the bad draws on R don't get their papers published. And then you know, for every weight in between, people are going to spend some time in Q and some time on R, and there's some quality threshold that clears the market. So in some sense, you know, there's nothing Nothing in this model that pins down what, whether we care about main ideas or whether we care about craftsmanship. Profession could have any set of norms. They're all stable. Um, and you know, this would be an example of what this equilibrium would look like. You know, this is a weight where people are putting weight on both. So people choose some t time Q. It must be a pretty high. People put some weight on Q. I oh, don't know. This is like equal weights, it looks like. Um, people put some weight on Q that's between 0 and 1. They come up with ideas. If your paper, if at the end of your time Q you end up with a bad idea, you send it to the journal, and the journal's like, in order to get your paper uh, accepted, you're going to have to reach this super high threshold on craftsmanship because you don't have much of an idea. You look at it and you're like, with, given that I, I made the dist distribution that you know, R is H of TR, uh, plus eta, where eta is uniform zero sigma, there's an upper bound to how good my craftsmanship can be even if I spend all the time on it. So you've got a bad idea. They tell you what to do. You're like, there's no way I can do that. You just give up. You don't revise your paper, and you go home. Um, if your paper is better, um, you revise it to death. You set uh, you know, TR to be 1 minus TQ. You do all the revisions you can. You get this draw on R quality. And if you get a good draw, you get accepted. You get a bad draw, you get rejected. And then if your quality is super high, then they recognize your quality is super high, and they tell you you only need to do this, reach this level of R quality to get accepted. So what you do is there you're able to get it accepted with probability 1 here. And up here, you can get it accepted with probability 1 and even take a vacation, some vacation time. So here you sort of like take some time off, but any of these papers that are super high quality, they get accepted with probability one, and you just do the, you know, you sort of set, uh, you know, you choose H of TR star is just equal to the thing that you're being asked to do, so that even if you get the worst data draw possible, the paper gets accepted with probability one. So you ensure that your paper gets in. Um, and in my model, people have these lexicographic 
preferences over um, paper acceptance and leisure. So it, anything that adds any probability of your paper getting accepted, you do it, and you only take leisure when your probability of getting in is zero, or when it's zero in marginal impact. Um, anyway, so you know this is what this is what we we think would happen, um, and so you know that's what a state that's what an equal mode look like. And then the question about you know like where di where do these sort of dynamics come from? Because uh, it's gotten harder and harder to publish papers over the years. Why do I think that happens? Uh, what I then add is an overconfidence bias. So everybody thinks their papers are better than they actually are. So you know either you think your cue is better than it really is, your idea is more interesting, or you think your craftsmanship is better than your craftsmanship really is because you're using the best techniques you know about, and you think therefore I'm state of the art when you're not. But everybody just thinks their paper is epsilon better, epsilon better than, it, than other people think their paper is. Okay? And so what's going to happen when people are learning is um, this norm with an overconfidence bias is going to confuse people because they're going to be sort of, ha two things are going to be happening to them. One is they're going to be submitting papers and then we told that you've got to reach this really, really high, well, that, what seems to you to be a really, really high line because you think your paper is better than it is. And you're like, wow, it's really, really hard to get a paper in. For my paper to get accepted, I have to do this laundry list of 67 things better than I'm doing today. And yet you also referee papers and you say, this is not as good as mine. You should reject it. And then you see the journal taking the paper. And so you have this sort of, Cognitive dissonance is like, why is it that I can't get my papers in and these mediocre things either that I refereed or I see in the journal are getting published? And so you have to sort of try to reconcile those two things in your mind and think, maybe I misunderstood the alpha Z process. Okay. Um, again, you know, here I could do something rational where, something fully rational where people have this prior over all alphas and z's that the world might have and a prior over the whole process that is being used to generate acceptance and regression, re rejections and think about the rational Bayesian updating when you're getting these sort of two conflicting pieces of evidence. How do you best, you know, in some sense it's a, be a Bayesian updating with, with the sort of the, the true state of the world is outside the, um, outside the, the sort of support of your prior because you don't think that you're biased. Um, but anyway, what I did instead was um, think about just a different objective function. That is, you know, I'm basically getting, uh, you know, two types of evidence. One is I'm being asked, these are the sort of R of Qs on my paper. And I'm trying to sort of figure out what is the correct, I'm trying to figure out what is the correct line. And this is what I think R of Q is on the observations on my paper. Uh, and I'm going to sort of say that people are sort of in some, one thing they're trying to do is fit a, a line to the data that they're getting on their own papers with some least squares procedure. But then the other thing they're doing is they're sort of seeing other papers are accepted or rejected. And every time a paper, if like this paper is accepted, uh, but this paper is also accepted, and this one's rejected, and this one's rejected, and this one's rejected, and this one's accepted. You know, they're trying to, in some sense, also fit a line to this data that separates the accepted papers from the rejected papers. Uh, and what I do, because entirely to make the model tractable, is say that you're using a least squares loss function for the things you're told about your own papers, and you're using a sum of absolute deviations loss function for the acceptance and rejections and trying to fit the two data together with the same line. And you know what's going on is that they're actually basically there, what's happening is in reality is there are two lines. This is the R of Q line, what you, what you think, perceive you're being asked to do, and this is the acceptance rejection line, which is lower. And you, you think you're being asked to do more because you think your quality is better than it is, so the data is really coming in on these two lines, and you're yet trying to fit a single line to this data, not recognizing that the observations from your papers are different from the observations on the other papers. Okay. And, and the observation of the paper is if, you ha if people have views on this, what happens? What happens is people perceive this line to be the line, and, and everyone thinks it's harder to publish than it is, so they always tell the authors when they're refereeing, you need to get really, really good to get in and you need to reach this high R of Q line. 
but then the editors can't fill the journal with papers who reach the high R of Q line. So there are these people down here who had the me medium quality ideas that revised them to death, who fell just short of what the referees told them to do, and then the editors take the paper anyway because they need to fill the journal. And so they like take the papers that were slightly lower quality, um, slightly lower quality on the R dimension than what they were told to do. So that's what the data actually looks like. And then when people are trying to sort of fit these sort of two data sources together, the Q, R of Q data and the acceptance rejection data, the best way to do that is, with, is, by, til is by tilting the line down. Because the, the surprise acceptances are papers that are low Q, high R, and get in. And so the best way that you can explain that on these really great papers I'm being asked to do a lot, and yet down here I see these low Q, high R papers getting in is to say, oh, I think it must be that you know, the best way to fit this data is to tilt the line down and think that R quality is more important than I thought, and, the, and these high R papers are getting in because R quality matters more. And so the argument is that what's going to happen is people are just going to keep being surprised that papers get accepted, that they refereed. The surprise acceptances are overwhelmingly low Q, high R papers that, that, and then, and so the best way to explain that those surprise acceptances and yet the high demands being made for the high Q papers uh, are tilting the line and thinking R quality is a little bit more important than I am. And so we end up with this situation where just perpetually everyone always is holding people to standards that are slightly too high and then slightly twisting their views to think about the importance of craftsmanship versus the importance of ideas. Uh, and this um, you know, graph shows you, if this is sort of, you think of this as the sort of set of social norms that would all be consistent with alpha on this axis and z on this axis, we're always staying slightly above, uh, slightly above that set of social norms. And then this dynamics, this model would just slowly drift and drift and drift and drift and drift. And you know, the argument is that you know, I, I'm going to argue that this was a 30-year disequilibrium process. For 30 years, we've been out of equilibrium. Referees are always slightly too high, under, trying to reconcile this sort of difference in their mind between the, sli the slightly too high standards they think are being applied with the acceptances they see. They just keep thinking that it must be the craftsmanship that got that one in, and then they keep just changing their beliefs about the importance of craftsmanship. Okay. Any questions there? So again, you know, right, the rule of thumb approach here is just I'm trying to say what the referees do. And, and I've actually, you know, um, some chance I will rewrite this paper doing the fully Bayesian version, which I, I think there's been big advances of Bayesian learning with misspecified priors in the last uh, 20 years, where I think maybe now I could solve this Bayesian model with misspecified priors and show that kind of what I say happens here happens in a fully Bayesian model with misspecified priors. But, I sort of think that the idea of the rule of thumb approach is just to say, think about what you think people would do. Think about what you think they would do that's reasonable. I, I don't think it's reasonable. I think it seems like referees are fairly naive, and this is how they're trying to reconcile the two things. This could happen, and then write down a model that you can actually solve. And like, why do I have a quadratic loss function in one part and a least absolute deviations loss function in one part? And it's exactly because that was the model I could solve. We might as well solve, write down models we can solve. And, and say what we can about them. Okay. The, let me say empirics on this. Uh, I have another kind of depressing paper uh, in, in the JPE looking at how long it takes a paper to get accepted from the time it's first submitted historically. Uh, and in the 1970s, uh, papers were typically getting accepted at all the top journals six to eight months after they were first accepted. Uh, and you know, it's kind of remarkable when you realize like at the time the Xerox machine had not been invented. Um, and so how did refereeing a paper work? You would type up two or three copies of your paper. You would send, or actually in the 1960s you would send in a single draft of the manuscript that your secretary typed. But you would send the paper in, uh, so 60s certainly, you sent the, your, your secretary typed one copy of the paper, you sent it to the journal, they sent it to the referee, the referee read the paper, made comments, sent it back to the journal office because that was the only copy. The journal office then sent the paper to a second referee. That second referee paper sent, made comments, sent it back to the journal office. The journal office 
made comments and mailed them, you know, mailed you a decision. Somehow in the time, papers were getting published, you know, five, six months after they were submitted. Uh, starting in the 70s, when the revise and resubmit was invented, things just got longer and longer and longer and longer. And by, you know, the year 2000, some journals were averaging two and a half years from the time a paper was submitted to get it published. Some were averaging two years uh, and so on. So that, and, and, you know, this is sort of the time that conditional on a good outcome, you know, the way the process tends to work goes like, right, the top journals have a 96% rejection rate. So you send it to journal one, they screw around with it for a year and a half, and then they reject it, and then a second one, and then they mess around with it for six months, and they reject it, and the third one, it's a year, and then they reject it, and then finally you get someone to spend three years revising it before they then publish, two, year, two or three years, and then they publish it. Um, so actually I had this sort of um, very depressing statistic that if you look at these sort of absolute stars on the IO market who do uh, empirical IO and how long it takes them to get their job market papers published, uh, the median time is now seven years. Uh, which, you know, it, it's a long time because then you spent also three years writing that paper before you first graduated from school. So uh, anyway, I, I hope future generations will sort of recognize what they're doing and solve this problem. And I've, I've made some attempts with limited success. Um, okay, a any questions? Yeah. How important is it in the model that the authors perfectly observe the quality of their ideas? Um, so it, it, I don't think it's, it's at all important. You know, I think what's going on is I'm having the authors do this sort of uh, least squares fit of the, of, you know, this. So like they're being asked to do, every time you submit a paper with quality Q, you're being asked to do R of Q. And you just fit a least squares line to that. So if, if there was sort of, a, if your paper were, you know, qualities were like this, fitting a line to it, I think would do roughly the same thing. Uh, what, what's important is the argument that the very high quality papers you're asked to do a lot and they do all get accepted because you do what you're being asked and the low quality ones are the ones that get in not doing what they were asked. So the high quality ones don't get in not doing what they were asked because they always do what they were asked enough. That, that's, I think, the main thing. Um, but the ra randomness, I don't think, would affect either, on either one shouldn't affect it. Um, let me say, you know, advertising is not something I can do in, in, in any do justice in this paper. You know, there is a field called marketing. Uh, I don't know if any of you are from the Sloan Marketing Department, but, you know, most business schools have marketing departments. Marketing departments have lots and lots of professors. You know, there are like a thousand marketing professors in the United States. There are many, many marketing journals, just like there are economics journals. Those marketing journals are full of papers. And like, you know, obviously people in marketing do advertising. You know, they teach entire, all, all of their courses are entirely marketing, not one week of, of my class or something like that. So there's an enormous literature out there. Um, marketing is a field where, um, I put here, you know, influences on marketing. So if you look at what's being cited by marketing papers, um, the largest, well obviously mostly they cite other marketing papers. So this is what non-business things are they citing. They do cite a lot of psychology papers and there's been sort of a rise of psychology and marketing over the last you know, 40 year time span where people in marketing are paying more and more attention to what psychologists are saying and citing what psychologists are saying. There's also, though, been an increasing trend in citing what economists are doing. And so, you know, now it's, you know, 6% of the citations in marketing papers are to economics papers rather than to marketing papers. So there's a substantial influence of economics on marketing. And if, if you look at what within economics are marketing people citing, you know, IO, which is the yellow line here, is a big part of what's going on in marketing. And so there's just you know, there are marketing papers that look like psychology papers or look very different from economics, but there are a lot of marketing papers that look like IO theory papers and that look like empirical IO papers. So they're just, mar you know, market people write all about way that firm firms can price to or make their products appealing to customers. And they write a lot about sort of empirical demand estimation and how advertising campaigns affect demand and so on. And both of those parts look a lot like IO. Um, so what I'm going to do today is, today I'm just going to do sort of a few classic models of advertising, and then it's, it's again, a week from Monday, I'm going to do some empirics on uh, advertising. Okay, so models of advertising. Um, generally, I think you can sort of say the way people 
in, in the economics literature sort of break down sort of three different, you know, obviously to explain advertising, you've got to say like, why is it that advertising changes what people purchase? If you start with our basic model of consumers have preferences, UIJT, if they buy product J at time T, and it's you know, XJT beta minus alpha PJT, and they buy the best thing, then what does an advertisement do? It, if it doesn't change your, you know, if, that, if that's your utility function, you're always maximizing your utility. Advertising shouldn't affect anything that goes on in the world. Um, and yet we see firms spend lots and lots of money on advertising. It must be advertising changes behavior or changes something that increases profits, what is it? Um, one thing, one sort of class of models is advertising can have informational content. You know, it can tell you that a product exists, that what the product's price is, what the product's attributes are. But it's like, you know, in some sense, it's like a search model. You don't know everything, but then the advertising tells you things that you would otherwise have to invest search effort in uh, figuring out, and that increases the number of people who buy the product. Uh, and you know, like right, classic examples like this, you know, informative advertising. You just get an ad in in the mail or in your newspaper for Target, and the advertising for Target tells you, you know, you can get these these boots for ten dollars and those jackets for fifteen or twenty dollars and these clothes for four or five dollars. They show you the pictures of things to tell you what what Target is selling and what it costs. And this would be informative advertising. Um, a second thing that advertising can do is not necessarily tell you anything about the product itself, but just signal to you something about the quality. Um, so for instance, like, let me look at these two ads. You, know, you guys are probably all too young to remember uh, pets.com. You know, pets.com in the first internet boom, just like when there was amazon.com, uh, pets.com started up around the same time. Uh, pets.com, just you know, miraculous rise and fall of a company in the space of, of, of a year or two where Pets.com just burned through like hundreds of millions of dollars. They had this sock puppet, and like they put the sock puppet on the Super Bowl and spent millions of dollars just having the sock puppet just appear on the Super Bowl. You know, the sock puppet did not tell you anything about, you know, obviously what is Pets.com? They sell like stuff for pets. Like, you know, we, you know what's in a Petco store. You probably know what's on Pets.com. Um, but, you know, the sock puppet was some sense, maybe you could sort of say that like, they just, wow, they just spent you know, $2.4 million to have the sock puppet just interviewing somebody during the Super Bowl. Uh, it must be they think they have a good product and if I actually go to pets.com, I'll buy stuff because otherwise, how could they have burned through $2 million in 30 seconds like that? And so there's sort of this sort of signaling idea. I would sort of say the same thing about like, you know, you look at the Patagonia ad here. Again, you know, like, it, I don't know, right? I mean, I mean maybe, it, maybe it's all Photoshop, but like, it must have been expensive to send some guy with a camera up to the top of some mountain with wearing those Patagonia stuff and taking the pictures. And it must be that their clothing, either this person's really not uncomfortable up there on that mountain wearing the Patagonia stuff and so the clothing is good or they're just spending a lot of money on the ads because they know that the, if I bought the clothing I would like it or something like that. And then the, I guess the third thing we think about advertising is advertising can be changing your preferences or directly affecting purchase decisions of non-rational things. So if I look at this commercial, you know, let's grab a beer and those people are having just a great time having those beer outdoors at some thing, you know, and, and they're all relatively attractive or whatever, you know, I, I, I must be, I think that like, you know, somehow if only I was having that beer, my life would be like that instead of what my life is like today. And I just, you know, I would, I would like to be those people and somehow if I just had that beer, this, this is me or something like, you know, like it, it sort of, it, it changes your preferences from being a person who wants to work on a problem set to being a person who wants to be out on the street drinking beer and, and it, your tastes change and therefore your purchases change. Um, okay, so, um, how do, no, so how do I model these and what do we, and, and what do we get out of the model? So first, you know, classic model of informative advertising is, is Butters 1977. Uh, Butters was thinking about N firms selling identical goods. Uh, there's this unit mass of identical consumers and they're all gonna get utility V minus P if they buy this good at price P. All the firms have some cost C of production. And this is a problem where the consumers, you know, Consumers don't know 
either that the product exists or where they would buy it. So what the firms can do is they can spend amount of money. Um, so if they spend A of X on advertising, their ads will reach a fraction X of, com of consumers. Okay, so it's like, you know, it, I, I guess good to think about this is like putting ads out there on the radio or, or print airwaves and just every ad you put out there, you're going to hit more consumers. There's decreasing returns because the, you know, first ads I send out all hit somebody, but then the, the later ads that I send out are mostly hitting people who already heard about my product. And so by having them hear about my product, I'm just wasting duplicated messages on them. And, and so I'm sending out these messages and the more people I want to reach, the higher is the A of X this money I'm going to have to spend. To, and you know, it could be that even getting to X equals one, this thing could almost asymptote to infinity if I'm trying to reach every person in the world. It's hard. Um, and so they consider a game where firms simultaneously choose two things, the amount of advertising X they're going to do and the price is P. And then consumers who buy at least one ad buy from the cheapest firm that they heard about. Okay, and again, the goods are identical, so it's just if V minus PJ is positive, then I'll buy it from the, you know, the cheapest firm uh, I found out there. Okay, and if I don't hear about a firm, I, I, I can't buy from them. You know, this, this could be a good model for like things advertised through infomercials on TV also or something like that. It's like if you see the infomercial, you can then buy the product and write down the phone number. Um, okay, observations. Uh, again, you know, this was one of the early papers that had an equilibrium with price dispersion. This is like the Spiegler paper I talked about earlier. This is like Stahl from a few weeks ago. Again, you know, some consumers are going to only get one ad. If the consumer only got your ad and nobody else's, then you want to set P equals V. But if they've got multiple ads, you know, we're again in this situation where in equilibrium we're going to get some distribution on prices that has an upper bound of V and then goes down from there. Um, and it's just determined by, you know, I want to undercut, but I want, I, I, you know, I, if, if they only see one ad, I'd like to be the highest, pr I'd like to set it price equals V, but then if there's, they might see two or three or four or five ads, and so I want, I undercut, we get this mixed strategy pricing equilibrium. Um, advertising levels, if, you know, A prime of zero is small, uh, and A prime of one is really big, so if I make it, you know, even more stark, if, if, you know, this thing starts out like in advertising the first people is really cheap and then reaching the last people is really expensive. There's going to be some internal level X star of advertising that I pick. And I'm going to pick it X star so that the marginal cost of reaching one more consumer equals the marginal profit I get off the last consumer I, may, I reach. Okay, so the, the, you know, first order condition is going to be the, you know, uh, Profit on the marginal consumer reached equals the cost of the marginal consumer reached. Okay. Uh, interesting observation that Butters has is that uh, in this model, advertising levels are socially efficient. You know, you might have thought this is like entry where there's business stealing, and because of business stealing, you could have too much entry, or it could be because it's like you don't internalize consumer surplus gains, there could be too little entry or entry being advertising. Uh, but in this model with the technologies he's got, advertising is socially efficient. And we think of that like this sort of as an argument that here's a special case where there's not a distortion and the informative advertising in the world should exactly match what a social planner would want it to be. And why is that? Well, so, you know, First order condition for X star gives the marginal cost of reaching the consumer equals the marginal benefit to the firm of reaching the consumer. Marginal cost of reaching the consumer is A prime of X star. What's the marginal benefit? You know, the marginal benefit, I'm indifferent, I'm mixing over these prices. So I'm both choosing a pure strategy X star and I'm mixing over prices. So it must be I'm indifferent, my profits are the same regardless of which price I choose for my price distribution. And so my profit on the marginal consumer is the same regardless of which profit I, price I choose from the price distribution. So I'm going to evaluate it looking at the case where the, I set a price at the upper bound of the price distribution, V. So if, what's the marginal value of reaching one more consumer when I set a price of V? Well, I get V minus C as the profit from selling to that consumer. And then 
uh, I get that multiplied by the probability that the consumer saw no other ad. Because when I set price V, I sell to them only if they got no other ad, because if they got any other ad, they'll find a lower price and they won't buy from me. But, you know, this is the social benefit of, the, of an ad, of reaching a consumer who's never been reached before. Because if a consumer has never been reached before, the social surplus from the firms interacting with that consumer goes from zero to V minus C. So what, you're, what, what we're getting is that the sort of private return to reaching one more consumer is the social return to reaching one more consumer. Um, and you know, it's not obvious if you think about any other price. When you said any other price, you are doing some business stealing and you are, you are stealing consumers away from other firms and you are increasing the consumer surplus of the consumers. But somehow this model is such that those two things are, are, do exactly offset. Uh, and so there's no, social, there's no social inefficiency here. So it's at least one case where we don't worry about sort of advertising being distortionary. And you know, obviously this is a, an extreme, you know, this is a, Butters has come up with a special case where this is true. Uh, if you had, you know, if you had the firm selling imperfect substitutes rather than perfect substitutes, you know, like we wouldn't get this, like, you know, we, we could get the sort of uh, kind of mixed strategy equilibrium, we, we could get the kind of pure strategy equilibrium pricing like we got with search with differentiated goods. You'd have the business stealing effects, you'd have the consumer surplus effects. But, uh, you know, I think in the like entry literature, we had this intuition that one of them was often going to be bigger than the others. Here, I think we don't have that intuition. Um, um, okay. Um, Second class of models I want to talk about then is sort of how do we think about signaling models of advertising and when, when would they work? Um, so Milgram and Roberts is your sort of classic paper doing this in the 1980s. Um, Milgram and Roberts model, nature, you know, like that all firms that are entering the market, they try to come up with some product, they invent some quality cue. We're just going to make it a two point support. Your quality is either low or high. Um, obviously, all the firms are trying to invent quality Q, but they sometimes come up with quality, quality H, they try, sometimes come up with quality L. Uh, you, know, there's some pro, you know, there's some common prior that the consumers and the firm have over the probability that the quality is high of a new product. The firm observes its own quality and then chooses a price P for the product and a level of advertising A. Um, Important in this model is consumers observe A. You know, the consumers observe that they just put that sock puppet on the Super Bowl, that was 2.4 million. You know, in some sense, this is what we refer to as a money burning theory of advertising. It, it almost doesn't matter what they did with the money. What is just like, it's like, yeah, those guys just put $2.4 million in dollar bills in a big pile and lit it on fire. That proves to me that, you know, they must have thought it was worth it for them to burn $2.4 million. They, so they must be the type of firm that wants to make big bonfires of money. Um, so anyway, consumers observe A. Um, they base an update on what Q is, knowing how, what different firms would do in terms of burning money or not. Uh, and so then they form a posterior on what Q is, and they buy the product. And then thought here is that this is like a dynamic model, although they don't really model the dynamics fully. But then after you buy the product, you learn something more about the quality. And then you may buy the product again, or you may buy it a third time. You may continue to buy it for many years. You may tell your friends about it, whatever. But so you sort of observe the A. You decide whether to buy. If you buy, you learn something about the quality. And then there's some repeat purchasing going on later on. They sort of say, you know, whatever's going on in all those later stages, we're just going to model this in a re reduced form way. We're going to say that the profits the firm gets are pi of p given q and q hat that depend both on the true quality q and on the quality q hat that consumers expect to receive when making purchase decisions. And generally, profit is going to be increasing in both of these arguments. Right? If, if consumers think your product is good, even though it's not good, they're still going to buy it once. 
and you're going to make money from them thinking it's good. But then conditional on how good they think it is, what makes them buy it or not, if it's actually good, then when they buy it, they're going to enjoy it, they're going to buy it again. And so your profit's increasing in both the true quality Q and in Q hat, which is their posterior on Q after you've sort of had your advertising campaign and set your price. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, observations, this model can have a separating equilibrium where only uh, firms with high quality advertise. So we get this equilibrium where, you know, you have these two things, a low price and zero advertising and a high price and some level of advertising, and all the low quality firms do this, all the high quality firms do this. Um, when is it that this can happen? You know, I, I think two things you, you're going to want to have. First is that repeat purchases are going to have to be important. If there were no repeat purchases in the model, this wouldn't happen um, because. If there were no repeat purchases, low and high quality firms would earn exactly the same profits. So if the high quality firms found it better to sort of set a high price and burn money, the low quality firms would also set a, make it set a high price and profitable burn money. So what you have to have happen is there have got to be the repeat purchases so that the high quality firms are willing to burn this money because they know the consumers will keep coming back. The low quality firms are only going to sell to the consumers once. So you have to like burn an amount of money such that the, you know, uh, it's got to be that, you know, pH minus PL or, you know, pH minus C, D of pH or D1 of pH minus uh, pH minus C, PL minus C. You know, so like imagine that this is the extra profits I get in the first period from burning the, from burning the money. It's got to be that this is less than A. Because if this is less, if, if this was bigger than A, then even the low quality firms would just go ahead and burn the money in order to get the extra demand in the first period. Okay? So it's got to be that like this is less than A, but this plus the long run benefit that you get from the repeat purchases in, at t equals two or t equals three or whatever does make it worth advertising. And so we need a repeat purchasing effect. And then we also need some kind of small, we need word of mouth learning effects to be small. Because if word of mouth learning effects were going to be small, you could just come in, uh, set, a, you know, set, a, set a price of pH, do zero advertising, have only a few people buy your product, and then those few people tell everybody, and they tell everybody, and they tell everybody, and the thing takes off, and the long run benefits are there even without having spent the money on the advertising in the first place. So what we need is something about Repeat purchases help, you know, getting people to buy once, the repeat purchases make it worth spending the advertising, and you can't do it without spending the advertising because you can't do it by just a small release and then let, let people sort of tell their friends instead. Okay. Um, you know, technologically, this advertising is money burning, right? It's not changing the utility functions at all, um, but it can increase, it can be socially valuable if it increases sort of the match quality. So if you imagine a model where you have, you know, there's some people who, who only really have value for a high quality, you know, like the, some people who are serious hikers and so if it's not a really good Patagonia coat that's actually going to keep you warm on a mountain, you don't want it. And then there's some low quality consumers who are just wearing it around town and if it doesn't actually prevent the wind from getting you, it doesn't really matter because you're just wearing it around the city. If the sort of advertising helps us with the match quality and lets the high quality, the people who want high quality buy high quality, the people who want low quality buy low quality, then this sort of money burning can raise utility. And we might not want to ban it even though it's not technologically valuable, but it can be sort of only way to convey si to signal information here. Okay. Um, and you know, in, in some models like this, you can actually even do signaling without any advertising at all. So it's possible that there can be, you know, don't go in advertising models, there can be equilibria like this, where some firms set a really high price and then people know that, that like, you know, the, the, they're only going to sell to a small number of people, so it must be they're expecting to sell to that small number of people over and over and over again, 
whereas you can set a low price and sell to a lot of people who just buy once because you know, and, and or something like that. So you, you can get you can get price as a signal. Uh, you can get price as a signal even without advertising, but it's you know advertising makes it easier to get signaling models to work out. Questions? So then I thought the final one, I will go to my, you know, things based on my uh, beer ad. And I, you know, here I'm uh, covering an unpublished paper that, that's sort of unpublished for 15 years or whatever. I'm sure Jesse has long since given up on this paper. Um, but I always really liked it, so I'm going to sort of keep covering it anyway. So, you know, this is a behavioral economics paper about advertising changing preferences. And, and you know, it starts out with noting there's a lot of very, very good evidence about fallibility of memory and manipulability of memory that makes you think that these things can work. So for instance, you know, the, um, one of these sort of very classic experiments, the, the uh, uh, famous person experiment is, I give you a list of people and uh, I write down, I give you a list of kind of famous people and I ask you which of these people people are famous. And like, you know, I put in a bunch of names on there, like, you know, Ban Ki-moon and Sebastian Weisdorf and whatever. And, you know, these people who are sort of people who you've kind of heard of and you're like, okay, yeah, Ban Ki-moon, that's some guy who did something UN official or something. And I don't, I don't remember quite who he is. Sebastian Weisdorf, that just doesn't ring a bell. I'm going to put not famous. And, and, you know, like you put names of actresses and whatever that, again, you know, I, I have no idea what that person's ever been in, but yeah, I, I know that's the name of some actress and whatever. And people are pretty good at this task of saying, is someone famous? And one of the interesting things is you give people that task, you sort of give them, here's 20 people. Is this person famous or not? And you know, some of them are just made up names. And people are very, very good at that task. They can write down famous, famous, not famous, famous, not famous, even though they don't have no idea who the people actually are. Um, and then you bring the same students back in the list into the lab one week later. You hand them exactly the same list that they said yes or no on and they're much worse at the task. And it's because like, okay, Sebastian Weisdorf, I've kind of heard that. Well, but is, is that because like Sebastian Weisdorf is some guy I've heard of or is it because he was a guy who was on the list that I did last week? And like people no longer can remember the things as well as they did the week before or whatever. Um, he, he also gives these examples of like these marketing experiments with like orange juice where you get people, have people taste orange juice and you sort of prime them before it to give it with the correct answers like, you know, you know, here's an, here's an orange juice that's got a really tangy taste or whatever, you know, and then here's an orange juice that's got a really sweet taste or whatever, like which one do you like? And then like the, one, the tangy taste one is just like, you know, you put vinegar in the orange juice and you just made it worse. But like if you've described it like, oh, here's a really sour orange juice taste or here's a really tangy one taste, somehow like if you've told them it's really tangy one, they're like, oh yeah, I like that one, that's tangy or something like that. And, and so, and, you know, his, his thought is like on the beer example is, People have had beer many times in their lives and they've had parties with their friends many times. And the thing is, you know, you like to sort of go to events where you're having a good time and you don't remember whether it was me who had a good time drinking the Budweiser, if it was those people on t I saw on TV having a good time drinking the Budweiser. And so then when I'm there in the store, I'm trying to remember, oh, should I buy the Budweiser or not? And I'm just trying to remember some previous time when I had a party and I served Budweiser, did people have a lot of fun? And I can't keep track of whether it was my party with the Budweiser where people had the fun, or it was that one on TV I saw with the people who had Budweiser where everyone had a great time. And I, in some sense, they've changed my memory and put all these memories in there that I can't distinguish from my own memories, and therefore I can't, I, you know, and so you, you're changing my preferences by changing what I remember about my prior experiences with the product confusing my experiences with the people on TV's experiences with the product. Um, so the way he does this is he has this uh, continuum of consumers who have types theta i. And the type theta consumers get benefit v with probability theta when they consume the good. So like, you know, could this just be depending on your friend group, you could be in a friend group where serving Budweiser at your party, 100% chance the party goes well. You could be in a friend group where serving Budweiser at your party, just 0% chance the party goes well because your friends all hate Budweiser. Um, anyway, but so each consumer is different in their sort of experiences when they've consumed the good. Um, consumers have 
consumed the good uh, on n prior occasions and gotten these draws, but they don't know theta. I can't go every time in my life that I've bought Budweiser for a party, how did that party go? Let me count them all up and add them all up. What I do is I just remember often just one. I just call to mind, let me try to remember the last sometime when I served Budweiser. I remember that experience. I remember how it went. And then I beige an update. Uh, so I have, I, you know, I have some, there's some common prior over the thetas. And then I beige an update to form what's my expected view of my preference for the product conditional on the events that I'm remembering. And then wh what Jesse does, the model's advertising is potentially altering memory in one of two ways. Um, one is an ad could just take a memory out of your head and stick a fake memory in instead. So it's just taking one of your n observations out, putting another observation in, so that when you do the Bayesian updating, you might recall that memory. Um, the other thing is, is, is sort of a, a notion of priming memories. That is, we all have all these memory in our, memories in our heads. Um, if, I, I, if I get you to make one memory, call that memory to the front of your mind, then the next time you're trying to call a memory to the front of your mind, that one will come forward again. It's sort of been more recent and more primed to come forward. And so here, you know, this is you show people a positive experience while they're watching the ad. They remember the most similar experience that they've had. And then because that experience has been brought through to the front of their mind, you're, it, it's more likely to be drawn the next time it comes out. So this is like you're manipulating memories by making people's memories more, you know, the making, changing the probability of recall of different memories that they have. Um, and then the paper itself, it, it sort of mostly focuses on this, you know, it, it gets into this sort of uh, highly rational case where, you know, consumers are aware that their memories are being manipulated and they are aware of the equilibrium level of memory manipulation that's going on by the firms. And then they try to actually, you know, uh, it, it, you know, I, if I were him, I may have started with more of the sort of non-fully rational thing where people are just being manipulated and don't realize it, but he's mostly doing the, they are trying to offset the manipulation of their memories. And then so they, they in some sense, they downweight it. They're like, I know this firm in equilibrium is advertising. Therefore, I know that this memory might be mine or might be someone else's. Therefore, I, I, un, when I'm doing the Bayesian updating, I'm doing the Bayesian updating of expectation of theta given ri and giving a star where I know what the equilibrium advertising level is in the world. And so I know, and I'm trying to undo this. Um, but nonetheless, the you know, point is, even in this model where memories are being artificially manipulated, firms might still want to manipulate the memories. Uh, and this is kind of like for information design reasons. You know, so you're not sort of changing the mean you're not changing the mean level of people's prior, posterior on theta, but you are changing the distributions on the theta. And so if you can change the distribution of thetas in a way that lets you extract more of the social surplus, it may make sense to advertise even if the advertising is being undone. So you know, if the advertising is not being undone, it's clear you want to advertise. But even when it's being undone, you might want to do it for information design reasons, where if I can get everyone to have the same posterior, then I can charge that posterior and extract all the social surplus, where if there's more heterogeneity, I only extract a fraction of the social surplus. Um, anyway, so it, you know, it's just got some interesting observations. And, and it's also interesting about, you can think about when advertising is going to be more and less likely, because you know, it's, it's going to depend on product quality. Because like, if you actually have a high quality product, you don't, need, you don't get as much marginal benefit from replacing memories in people's minds with fake memories, because the true memories are good. And so you can get this sort of advertising as a signal of bad quality and, and various interesting things. OK. okay. Uh, anyway, I am out of time. So anyway, um, Monday, I'm going to sort of, again, I'm going to do auctions. Uh, it's going to be mostly auction theory. I am going to do one empirical paper that I really like. This is the Hendricks and Porter paper about offshore oil um, uh, drilling auctions. Uh, and then, yeah, that's, that's planned for next week. I'll do auctions. Tobias comes in Wednesday and does uh, structural empirical auctions. And we go back to advertising periods the week after.